when a deer turns his head and a woods move. Oh, that's a good thing. Coco Puff's house, as per usual, we're gonna go pick him up and swing back to New Hampshire. Cause after yesterday, we're going back. A lot of deer running around. Dad was really close multiple times. Beautiful buck. We had deer going everywhere. It was great. When you when it, when a deer turns his head and a woods move. Oh, that's, oh, a, that's a good thing. That's a oh, good sign. Oh, it's like mugging the horns on that thing. That's a good sign. Oh, yeah. So we'll go up and see what we can happen. I, I don't think he's kind of the, the biggest buck in, in the land right there. He he didn't react well to me snort wazing him, and I did two or three times, and I know he didn't smell me or anything, and he just heard me coming, and he wasn't sure what I was. And and I grunted quite a bit, and the first time, it's wicked crunchy, crusty, and I'm walking, and it's chunk, chunk, chunk. So I just kept coming steady and grunting every 10 seconds just grunt yep. walk grunt walk and he in a wide open openish hardwoods on the edge of a little tiny break in the terrain he stood there and and i saw his leg and i'm like oh look at that thing and i got my gun on him and it's just a little bit of his leg like four inches of his leg sticking out behind this like 16 inch maple and there's quite a bit of brush behind him, uh, trees behind him farther down, so it kind of hid a little bit of his main beam and his ear and one eye. And, and I'm looking at it about 45 yards there, and I get the, I see deer leg, and I pull my gun right up, and I draw on him. Now, see, I stopped walking. I should have kept walking. I'd have got out into the open just a little bit more. As soon as you stop, as soon as you start on a cross, that's when they run. And... I stopped and he ran and it's like, oh, you bugger. And when, when he turned his head to run, the woods moved. Oh, you had some horns. And then he stayed behind these trees and there's another hole on the other side and I got all ready to shoot into that and he never came into it and he just, and then I took off running and tried to do my best to get, but it was like a 45 yard sprint. And the time I run 40 yards, he's already cleared 200 and he's down and across. and. What a deer, and just nothing you can do, you know. And I, I ended up jumping in three times. He blew at me every single time, and I grunted right up to him every time. So I don't think he's the biggest buck in that spot. Uh, there's another really huge track, and he's a big stepper too. This one's got a smallish track, but a, boy, the horns were impressive. I, I'm following him, saying, man, this ain't the big one. And I'm going along, and then when I see the main beam on that thing, oh, right out to the end of his nose. And when he was feeding, there was just horn marks in the snow. Oh, what a dude. One of the things that happens, um, the difference between uh, late and early season and the center of the season, um, snort wheezing deer um, works really well, especially for most deer in the beginning of the season. Yeah, the pre-rut. And during the season, like when the rut's going really good, when they're getting beat up, snort wheezing a little buck a lot of times won't make him come to you because he's been he's been getting threat walked and been getting beat up by whoever's the boss in that area. And you know, it's, it it's is right. risky during the rut or a little bit later into the rut to snort wheeze any buck because if they're not the biggest one, they're gonna they might peel out and you might not get a chance because you might scare them off. Lots of calling. They don't like I've lately calling has not been working. Um, not for me anyway, not for Jimmy. Like we. Of course, your buck yesterday, different story. Every deer is different, but lately a lot of calling has, they haven't liked that. They haven't liked a lot of like, of course, a lot of calling is like, hey, 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 hey. It's kind of like pestering them a little bit. Yep. And you know, most of the time it's curiosity that makes them stand there. Um, but also they, they know better now. Well, the other thing we're hunting, we hunt really high pressured areas. We're not way back in the boondocks someplace where nobody hunts. We not, hunt where a near, lot of not people New hunt, not, or, or even in Maine. We were in high pressure areas all the time. So the deer are running into quite a few people, and you know, especially up until now, when I played the buck game with a deer, he only heard a snorweeze from other 
there. He never heard it from people or didn't hear grunting from people that much and whatnot. And when they have a few bad experiences with calling, boy, they learn that in a hurry. And, you know, after a couple of years of doing that, you know, Mushroom Buck, he, I couldn't do that to him anymore. I hunted that deer four years. And I would played the buck game with him a bunch of times. And it would only work on the first time I approached him each year on the first time I jumped him. After that, he's like, oh, it's that guy. And from then on, the, the grunting didn't, didn't do anything anymore. And it was just, and when it's crossed and you're coming anyway, there's nothing you can do but just keep coming. And a lot of times, if you do a sneaking on cross, You'll never get anywhere you just near. Just kind of keep keep quiet, like as far as making noise, uh, making noise with your mouth or using calls and stuff. Yeah, I'm breaking. The rest sticks. of the time, just right. keep coming nice and steady. Don't don't go 100 miles an hour, but don't go too slow either. Just walk right along. Yeah. Um, keep your head up, keep swinging, and you'll probably get the best chance to look at a deer late season. What really Especially surprised me about that buck yesterday is that he had been laying in one spot for the, almost the entire night, and had a bed and a whole bunch of feeding and hadn't moved hardly at all because his we got snow um, about 10 30 11 o'clock at night and he had spent the whole from 11 until right when I came along and jumped him he's been there for six or eight hours in one spot so they're already starting to slow down they're and they're eating like crazy and laying down and they get up and eat like crazy and lay down again yep. and They'll take a break, you know, a buck will rut like crazy for a couple, three days, and then he'll kind of slow up some, and, and he'll just like take a break and eat and get caught up again, and then when he feels good, he'll go right back to having energy. And when I got him up, I, I got up uh, the, the smaller deer first, and he runs off. The buck is about 300 yards from this other deer, and I'm not sure if he knew, if maybe he heard the first deer blow and run off, I'm not sure, but when that deer went, it must have put him on the alert a little bit, and then he heard me coming, and then he bounds off. Now, he had been there for so long that now he's got plenty of energy, and I get him up, and he kangaroos for four or 500 yards, run and walk and run and trot and trot and walk, and then jumpity jump, and taking six foot bounds, and then eight foot bounds, and then slow up a little bit, and just, you know, like stay ahead of you. Most of the time, you jump a deer, he just runs away from you for a while, and, relax. and then relaxes, and he gets on this deer trail, um, where a whole bunch of deer been going back and forth on a runway and he, he's going down the runway and he's got his head down he's sniffing he's checking it out and I'm like well he's kind of already forgot about me a little bit and he goes right down the runway and he follows it for four or five hundred yards and then uh, slows up and he actually comes to a stop and he's listening and then he hears me coming and I see him and I see the rack and then off he goes he went for another three-eighths of a mile and slowed up a little bit, came to a whole bunch of humpy bumpy terrain, which is good, and, and it helps cover my sound and my sight. And when I pop over the knob, he's about 100 yards away in a really thick spot. I, I couldn't, there's no chance of me seeing him right where he was right there. And he had a pretty good beat on me. I was in a little more open, he was a little more covered. He's looking out of the cover, standing on an old bed underneath a hemlock tree, and he's looking back at me, and he blows and runs. I can't see him, and there's nothing I can do, of course. And then he just takes off, goes again. He went another four, five, six hundred yards, comes to a, a, a whole bunch of tracks and a doe. And when they get to other deer and you've been chasing them, it's a big buck and he's running. And then he slows up. He and he, especially if he wants to get rid of you, he'll bring you to other deer. Now when he gets to them, he'll slow down and walk through them. Or just just run by them real easy. And they'll they'll just watch him go by. Oh, what's that guy doing? And then he takes off again and you come along and then you bump all of them so he'll go by those other deer for a little ways and stop and he'll watch their reaction to you when he comes along um, he's just, you can tell he's trying to get rid of you and especially an older buck is more likely to do this and they do it quicker um, because they've been chased before you know over the years and um, any amount of chasing you educate him as the day goes and he becomes more kind of almost used to you And he knows what what to expect the most I've ever jumped a buck in one day and moved him and moved him is 12 times Move one buck 12 times in a day where I jumped him and, and just and I got to get him in a spot where He's screwed and I'm not most of the time. I'm screwed and he's not yeah. um, And if he's in a real tight area where you can't see very far or anything you got to get him out of there 
and some areas are tight like everywhere That's, and if he's smart enough to circle in yeah. it you're never going to get near him but if you can bust him out of there and let him get out there a ways let him forget about you just a little bit and then give him a little break and then move up on him if he never stops running or you just keep bumping him real hard repeatedly over and over and over that, that's a whole new game I mean it's one thing to go out and track a buck that doesn't know you're coming it's another thing to track a buck that knows you're coming you've already hit him five or six times and he's really like this guy's trying to kill days, me days days in a row too. yeah yeah where you just keep hammering him every day one. every day and, and you keep chasing him he'll jump into water um, swim some wicked water run to posters run uh, up rivers in order to like we've we had a couple this year that run up and down brooks so yep. like would hop in a brook run down it 100 yards hop out go down it 50 yards hop back in and in order to lose us because that's that's probably something that happens when they get chased by coyotes you know yeah wolves yeah yep. so deer deer don't deer when they're following other deer they don't look for tracks they smell yeah and they happen to be walking over tracks they that, come to them they go oh what's this and they smell it and it's wolves like, coyotes, like in canada they, really they, do it they smell yeah. you and it's like of course they don't know what way the tracks are facing like they don't understand that the, the, their foot is pointed in the front and like they don't get that <laughs> they just know the the strength of the smell like how strong it is so they would dive in a dive in a brook to because that's what hides the coyotes and stuff from following them so they would think that would work with us but of course we're visual we're not smelling them out i mean you can you can smell them a little bit but you know we're not tracking with our nose to the ground like a dog is and that that's a major disadvantage of tracking is that when you're tracking them you're the one that's moving a lot of the times it's not them so if they're standing there in a nice tight spot like he was saying and you come walking up to them you're walking through the woods like if you're standing there and somebody's walking through the woods you're gonna see them first often before they see you because not only is there you know the color the shape and all that but there's movement and sound and sound and it's like that's that's why a lot of times sitting sitting you don't get caught as much you know you might have a little bit of the wind problem but you get that in tracking either way if you're in the woods your wind, your smell, your scent is going everywhere, but the, when you're moving, that's when they get you. No, if if you have especially small woods and you've got one particular bucket you're really after, some of the better advice would be to leave them alone until you get the right day. You know, when when it's windy, the snow's quiet. Brand new snow. Yeah, brand new snow. Uh, something where you know at least new enough so that there's tracks, but not old enough so there's barnyards. You know, and. Uh, also, too, the biggest buck around, you know, so that his his track is fairly easy to pick out in the midst of lots of tracks. Um, my problem yesterday at the very end of the day was that there is another buck equally big in the spot that he ran to, and all the other deer were running everywhere, and everything was brand new, smoking fresh, and I even saw some of these other deer. So, like, I got into this crowd, and they're all running, and now they're all heading up and away, and we're 2.2 miles from the rig on the GPS, and, you know, you'll have that. So, you do the best with what you got, and yesterday, the deer had all their senses. They could hear, see, smell, yeah, everything was optimum for them. The light was good, there was no fog, everything was clear. We we also had a horrendous crust, so they can hear really good. I could hear Taylor coming to me a couple hundred yards away. That means a deer might hear it 400 yards away. So they're gonna hear you. You're playing to their curiosity that they'll stand there long enough to see you before they run. Some big deer, especially an older, even older does that wait. are real smart, they, they're not curious. They say there's something coming. I don't care what it is and away I go. Another kind of disadvantage to grunting is that if a buck has a doe with him and say the doe has really been pestered like crazy by bucks because she's just about to come into heat or something and she's got the biggest one around with her and you come along grunting she goes oh another buck more hassle and off she runs you know and then she takes the buck with her and now you're screwed so sometimes the buck will wait and he'll he'll like protect the doe and he'll stand there and she'll run off and he'll just stand there and especially a big one who knows he's kind of the biggest one around he'll stand there or he'll say man screw you and away i'll go they're unpredictable that way and it's just a case of you know getting lucky-ish in a way well, because it's, it's, you've got to have the right thing the happen. most of whatever situation you have if it's loud if the snow is loud and there's not a lot of wind just you just have to deal with it and sometimes you know things are what they are
Yeah. You do what you can with what you got. And, yep. you know, you, you got to risk it. If you don't risk it, you're, you don't try and walk up to them. Well, you'd spend all of today just looking at nothing. You know, a crusty, crusty day. Well, it might be better if you know the deer are on their feet. If you see some deer on their feet and they're out walking around and feeding and uh, you, you want to sit during that time when the deer are moving, great, just do it. Cause, or, or even if you walk, walk real slow. Three steps and wait three, four minutes. And then three steps and wait three, four minutes. And that real kind of slow still hunting through a really barnyard area would be great. That, that's what we'll really do a lot. But. It's tough. It, crust is a bugger, but I'll take it over no snow at all. Yep. Definitely. I don't care. At least you can track. Good snow, bad snow, doesn't matter. Like Lanny Benoit would say, good snow, bad snow, doesn't matter. Just give me snow because at least I'm on something that I know is fairly fresh. I'm in an area where I'm pretty sure there's lots of deer. And if I look down and there's no tracks on the ground, I'm in the wrong place. You know, it's a rut. You want to be on top of tracks. It's the winter time and they're yarding. You want to be on top of tracks. So you make the best of what you get. And just have fun and don't overthink it. It's easy to overthink on it. Put too much into it and make the deer smart. You know, they're not really smart. They just have a, a great, um, you know, great senses. And, and they use them. They use them. Every day. They, yeah, they're non-stop 24-hour deer. We're just, you know, four or five week hunters. And most hunters are like weekend guys where they get out two or three weekends. So you, you do the best with what you got. Sharpen your senses and stay alert and don't flip flop. No walking around thinking, oh, there's nothing here. Because the second you do, whoo, and off they go, kaboom, kaboom. It's like, man, why wasn't I paying attention? You know, as soon as you let your guard down, you, you start, your attention goes somewhere else. That's usually when they show up. <laughs> Casey pretends that there's nothing going on. Oh, I'm not paying attention. But he really is. <laughs> so I'm going to fake him out. <laughs> yep. We're running a whisker late today. We needed some sleep. Taylor's only slept like eight hours in the last 48, so he was tired. I was tired. And like, if you get, if deer hunting turns into a job, time to take a break because your senses aren't as sharp as they should be and you want them to be. You, you need to be on the ball. This is deer, okay, man? Most of the time, they're pretty darn sharp. And especially late season, when they've been hunting like crazy, woo, they're on it. And anything twitches at 200 yards and they're gone. And, and they run away behind a tree. Oh, but I, I, the woods moved when he turned his head and I'm like, look at the horns on that thing. Oh, and off he went. His track weren't that impressive, but boy, that w he had a nice stride, big long body on him, but small feet. And I don't know, I think it's, I think we gotta call him like Lieutenant Dan. He isn't quite the captain or the the big guy. He's not, he's not the colonel, you know, but he's a nice deer. I'd like to meet up with him or Cankles today. Maybe we can run into either one of them. Buck. And there's quite a few smaller ones there too that might really fit the, fit the, you know, ear tag. Yep. So we'll see. They fit the description. Yeah. And Taylor needs a deer for the freezer, at least. Eh. At least. Eh. Be nice to have him. Yeah, it ain't a big deal, though. Never worry about it. Never taking it. I like that. I like that one. If you don't get a deer, it does not say anything to how good a hunter you are. No, or how much effort Remember you Remember that. That's right. It's true. If you don't get a deer, it doesn't mean you're not a good hunter. It just means that it didn't. It just didn't. You know, it's like an average, an eight percent success rate. Eight percent on average. So it's like out of the ten million hunters or something like that, eight percent are gonna get a deer. That's why you're. Don't worry about it. That's what we are in Vermont. If about eight percent hunter success rate. So eight. Well, yeah, it's, out it's of probably 100. it's probably different elsewhere when there's right. a lot more deer. But. Well, probably. Yeah. So we're gonna get cocoa puff and we're good to go. It's and bright out today.